Great. Can you all hear me? Yeah? Right. So, um, yeah, thanks for the invite. It's been a bit of a... Um, I would have come up earlier, but uh, I was unfortunately already pre-booked yesterday. Um, it's been a, a, a good early morning, very eclectic mix of talks, and now we're going to jump from geochemistry into um, drone technology and some of the potential for the future and some of the early work that we've been doing at Monash University. Um, Monash has just invested heavily in, in this equipment and in uh, the digital pipelines, what we call the digital pipelines around it. In fact, they've put down around $5 million and they've put together what's called a platform, which is basically centralized facilities that anyone can access. And um, that's built on the back of an ARC LEAF uh, grant that won some very special equipment I'll tell you about in a minute. And at the same time, I'm in the middle right now, actually, of putting together a pilot project with Oscope, which uh, would hopefully uh, deliver national, um, nationally available equipment and ways of analyzing the data that comes off it for, for anyone who wants to use it, in commercially and, and in terms of research. Um, this platform is all around uh, bringing together people who use it, like us as geologists, next door to robotics engineers, computer vision specialists, um, people who have expertise in deep learning and so on. So we have developers and we have users. And of course, being drones, you need to have some certain amount of uh, regulatory oversight. And um, the advantage of putting all this equipment and all this uh, approach into one facility is that the regulatory oversight can be dealt with there. So we actually have uh, the, the, the operator certificate, uh, the chief pilot qualification, I myself am a qualified drone pilot, and we have a line of communication with the Civil Aviation Safety Authority. And um, some of the equipment that we've been using for geoscience applications already is just shown here in this little kind of gimmick sketch. Uh, these are very familiar instruments, the, the, the DJI Phantoms. Um, for a while, uh, you could just buy them at Christmas for your kids and they have a very usable camera on board and they're excellent for a technique known as photogrammetry. There's a new one that's just come out that has an RTK built into it, so you don't any longer, if you want a really precise measurement, you no longer need to be taking an RTK into the field and using ground control points, but the actual imagery coming off the machine will have that kind of precision that you require. But some of the other instruments here that are really interesting in our facilities is thermal hyperspec, which will go across the visible near infrared and shortwave infrared range. And this is the only instrument of its kind in the country. LIDAR um, and uh, multi-spec. We also have something known as an L-band radiometer, which I'm not showing. And that will do things like measure soil moisture. Um, so it has applications in the industry to uh, monitoring things like tailings, dams, and so on. Uh, now, a lot of these, these drones, they will fly for 20 minutes to 30 minutes, and they will cover within that range, within that time, these multi-rotors, they'll cover, you know, with, a, with one flight, you can, you can do about a square kilometre, um, depending on the technique. Um, if you're using photogrammetry, it's a square kilometre of really high resolution data. But obviously, in industry, we, we have a need to go beyond that, and that little multi-rotor at the top there is a hybrid engine multi-rotor. So, we're quite used to seeing drones that have fixed wings being able to fly large distances. That machine at the top can fly for four hours. And it does it by having a feedback between the, 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 the petroleum-driven engine and the batteries in the system. And it just keeps going. And I prefer to use multi-rotors because they give us a degree of flexibility with topography um, and uh, with management of the systems. They also can carry heavier cameras. Uh, this is just a, this slide here just shows you an example of some of the different outputs and also uh, hints at where we're going to in the very near future. So that's LiDAR. We've already got the equipment that can do this. LiDAR can deliver you very, very high resolution topographic information. But it can also give you information on biomass. So you can see here it's capturing the, not only the topography, but the tree structure. Um, and in addition, it's so high resolution, it's even capturing infrastructure such as pylons. It's, it's becoming a, an industry standard technique. It's quite new. It's definitely emergent technology. But the applications for this um, are very broad for the industry, not only in exploration, but um, 
uh, clearly in terms of if, you, if you're interested in things like monitoring your rehabilitation uh, processes on waste dumps and so on. The middle image is hyperspec, so that's an example, actually, that's actually a visible near infrared image. You're looking down, a bird's eye view of a coal lignite mine from Germany. This is not a, this is not a survey that I collected. Um, the, the, that there is the background photo, but superimposed on that is the visible near infrared um, scan over that, over that um, uh, landscape. And what it's showing you is actually acid mine drainage. Those colours represent different iron oxides. So it's mapping out acid mine drainage in, in the environment. This is just a simple thermal image. Um, I threw it up there to give you, to, to highlight the fact that, you know, it does actually show quite a bit of information in the natural environment. Uh, it's also potentially useful in the minerals industry for things like um, looking at, at water um, impacts in the round infrastructure or leaks. Um, and even things like monitoring things like heap leach tanks and stuff, you want to check for hot spots and so on. Um, now over on the right and in the middle is the hints, of, hints to the future. We're doing a lot of work with visualization experts. and We're putting the data that we collect from these instruments into immersive environments. Uh, obviously you can do a lot on laptops and stuff, but to be able to walk into your data like this or to put on the, the, um, the Vibe goggles and actually interact with it in a group environment uh, is often very powerful and helps you actually see things you just miss otherwise. And on the right there, we have gravity, uh, sorry, gravity and Aeromag. Um, Aeromag by drone has been done for a while, but it's not um, considered um, an industry standard technique yet. Um, but uh, we're actually working with a partner and we think we can do it very successfully. Gravity is a really interesting one. Um, this is a technique that's only just been developed. That's, that little MEMS gravimeter is actually based on an iPhone um, accelerometer uh, in, you know, yeah, in you know, everyone's iPhones. So this instrument is showing you a double spring, and it's actually 10 millimeters across, I think. Is that right? 10 millimeters across. So the idea is that once, um, once you put all the casing and the electronics around this, you will have a gravimeter that is no, no heavier than 500 grams in weight. So the people who invented this are actually from Glasgow University in the UK. They've already put the instrument around um, uh, volcanoes, I think in South America, and they've developed it as well for, um, initially for uh, some simple tests on board a drone. In, our, in my case, what I'm interested in doing is using that to hop um, instruments through the landscape and collect quite high resolution gravity surveys over a short period of time and at a cost effective rate. Now we do a lot of photogrammetry and photography from drones, it's a standard technique and it's an off, you can get a heck of amount of information from it, uh, certainly as a geologist, as an exploration geo. And the obvious next step is to go from the, the GIS data that's delivered to applying machine learning techniques to see if you can actually start to extract automatic signals. And I'm not going to talk about this very long, but just to show you them, these are preliminary results, um, very early days. But we, here you can see an image from some coastal outcrop. And even as a geologist, it's, you have to spend just a few seconds looking at it before you realize there's different types of gray. But actually the, um, the CNN, the, 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 the neural network approach which we used, was, begin, was able to draw out those geological boundaries relatively quickly and even identify some of the, um, the finer features going through this. In fact, there's two different types of dike and you can see it's beginning to pick those out in the imagery. What was interesting to me is that this is the geological map that the, the artificial intelligence produced from this image. These things are known as confidence maps. And they actually are what the, the software has, uh, thinks is most likely, this pixel is most likely to represent. So you can see here we've broken down different classes, water, dolerite, tonalite, gabbro. And you can actually see the confidence maps show quite a bit of information. We just ran a simple exercise. We, we gave those confidence maps to some geologists along with the image and we said, okay, Based on that information and this, give us a map. We then took those confidence maps and this image and we gave it to the non-experts, people who had never picked up, never done any geology mapping in their life. And we asked them to make a map. And I was a little bit shocked to find out that it was the non-experts who made the better map at the end of the day. 
And I think that speaks a little bit to, co uh, to cognitive bias. You know, as a geologist, we look at this image and we think, oh yeah, I know what that is. If you're a non-expert, um, you're a lot more careful about the data you're being given, and so you're more cautious in, in how you're interpreting. Um, but I'm interested in that as well, because it kind of opens up the opportunity to do things like citizen science, um, where you might have big data sets and not enough time to deal with them. So you can put them on the web and actually get people like gamers to have a go at making a map for you. Um, now, I'm talking a lot here about data from drones rather than the, than the techniques themselves, because I think this is where the real innovation lies in. So we've, we started a project where we want to be able to you know, do a lot of careful field observations and supplement them with uh, the collection of data from a drone using processes such as photogrammetry. But then in real time, or near real time, speed up the steps where you go from the data collection to creating a 3D model to extracting secondary data sets which show you something about the geology or interesting features in it, and then ultimately producing information. We think we can do this in a single pipeline, <coughs> semi-automatically, so that if you're not an expert in how to use this, the, the software to do this, you'll still get products out of it that are sensible, and hopefully have it delivered back to you while you're still in the field. And the reason why we think we can do that is because of the cloud, and because of um, recent advances in, in um, GPU technology where you can literally take what used to be the equivalent of a supercomputer, it looks like a hard drive and you just plug it into your laptop. So you can have quite powerful compute at your fingertips out in the field. Yeah. <clears throat> now I'm just going to show you some examples of the early work we've been doing on this and that we'll use Century Mine as a, as a as an illustration, and for those of you who don't know, Century Mine large lead zinc deposit up near the Gulf of Carpentaria, shown by that Google image in the top right. And we did a survey there a long, quite a few years ago now, and um, created an, a beautiful photogrammetric model of one of the walls. Photogrammetry, again, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is the technique of taking photographs from lots of different angles, they're overlapping. They're not systematic. There's no GPS attached to them necessarily. You don't need special control of the wall. All you need is the images, but you can use a technique as known as structure from motion photogrammetry, which can recognize the pixels in the different photos. And from that, it ultimately builds up a dense point cloud, and you can then turn that into a 3D wire mesh or extract a digital elevation model and get an orthorectified photo from it. Just the sorts of data products that, as geoscientists, we use all the time. That's a technique that's come from computer vision, and it's really transformed the world of photogrammetry. And um, <clears throat> this is um, the model that we came up with from the west wall of Century Mine. And <clears throat> this is a particularly interesting part of the mine because it was collapsing. Now, when you were out on the, the, the large view of, that, of the mine, you could see it looked very photorealistic, but as you zoom in, you can actually identify the individual pixels. This particular wall, we, we flew that in, I think, one flight, which would have been 15 minutes. It might, be, it might have been two flights, so half an hour. And what I'm doing now is I'm analyzing that data set in a software known as Cloud Compare. Here, we're just looking at the, we're converting the, the RGB values that are associated with the pixels into a single scalar value, which helps draw out different features in the wall. Um, I'm <clears throat> going up and I'm looking now at uh, the normals and I'm going to again look at a different way of, of um, imaging the data set there. This is a hue saturation value um, color ramp instead of an RGB color ramp and again you can see it sort of highlights different features that you, your eye doesn't initially observe in the data. If we zoom back out <coughs> and go back to that edit tool um, you can look at things like gradients in, um, gradients in color or curvature. Uh, so I think, that's a, I think that's a curvature map. Um, I can't quite remember what I was doing there. But again, these are just ways of processing the data to highlight different features. And in particular, you can see in this top wall here, it's pulling out the, the small normal faults where the wall is beginning to collapse into the pit. Um, at the, the far back end of that collapse. 
And um, it should be, <coughs> I should emphasize this point. Ah, this is an interesting one. So what we're looking at here now is a map of dip direction. And in a minute, I'll show you dip. So this is a map of dip. And again, that's a really powerful scalar calculation of just from the RGB data. So this is all just from the photographs. Um, <coughs> now what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in and we're going to cut out that top section of the wall where the normal faults are. As many of you will be aware, there is no way a geologist would be allowed anywhere near these walls or, or any kind of engineer, even under rope access work, because these walls are far too unstable and dangerous. That means there's an awful lot of data that's going missing in this exposure that you simply can't get access to. Um, data that's potentially important for predicting how unstable the wall is and when it's likely to collapse. With this kind of digital approach, you can get access to those walls and you can actually collect an enormous amount of data very, very rapidly. And you can do simple things like I'm showing here, where you extract parts of the wall and you very rapidly isolate what, where the faults are. And then you can export those to other software packages. Now, as we finish in this particular video, I just wanted to emphasize everything you just saw there was real time. So I didn't. This isn't a pre-prepared video in the sense of I didn't actually create those data sets and, and then show them, you know, flash them up. That calculation, I was create, capturing the video there and actually doing the calculations in real time. So everything you've just seen now was as fast as it would be on your own laptop. So moving just towards the end of the talk, <coughs> again, focusing on how you can handle the data and do smart things with it. We started to um, ask questions of how we might map geological boundaries and faults and planar features really, really quickly instead of having to painfully digitize them, and how you might extract things like orientation and thickness and spacing information from it. And we've used a, a, a technique known as the least cost path solver. This is now freely available in point cloud software known as Cloud Compare. And it's freely available in a tool, a plugin called Compass. And <clears throat> the technique, and there's a photo uh, there. This is a manually interpreted image where someone's painfully digitized those faults. And there's one that was generated using the technique. So you can see very comparable results. The technique is simply um, illustrated in these diagrams where you might have a series of points in your point cloud. And you might look at, say, their color property or um, their darkness light properties, or even the curvature properties, or something like that. And you say, well, I want to follow the features that are all dark. And it will map out. It will link between the pixels that have the darkest um, uh, property. <coughs> so in this video here, I'm just showing you, I wonder if I can pause it. Showing you an example of a data set where um, a student of mine has used, who, who built the, the technique actually, has used it to analyze 50, square, 50 kilometers long of dike margin at 10 centimeter intervals. So basically he had all these wonderful exposures in his field area. He used the least cost path solver to map out the boundaries on those dikes. Oh, blimey, it's rushing through. Um, those dikes were mapped to using the least cost path solver. <coughs> each, in, each 10 centimeters, you can get a, a, a structural orientation measurement. And that was depicted there on the Stereonet. And <coughs> you can see from the, you could have seen from the Stereonet, there's several populations that spring out instantly in the data set. What Sam can do with that information, then again, at the sort of 10 centimeter level, is you can actually measure the spacing between the dike margins. But you can imagine if you have faults and you want to load the spacing between the faults, you could do a very similar thing. So here you go. Here's the thickness measurements between the dike margins. <coughs> and, um, oh, do lie me. So I apologize for the jumping of the video here. That's often a buffering issue with the projectors. But once you have data like this, you can then, of course, begin to use it in a smart way. So what that Sam did in this case was he collected that sort of data all the way around this caldera, which is a caldera from the Canary Islands. And he was able to show using these little rose diagrams, which are extracted from that information, that actually there was a radial orientation to the dikes 
and they were mapping out a volcanic center somewhere in the middle here, which you can no longer see. And he was able to go <coughs> from there and um, isolate the dikes within the dike population that represent the, the, the radial volcanic intrusion phase from dikes that um, uh, were intruded at different stages. So the, the features that come from the, the radial phase in the stereo net are shown in red, and the other ones were from the blue, uh, were shown in blue. And you can then isolate different populations very, very quickly. That's just an example or an illustration of how rapidly you can begin to draw geological conclusions from data sets like this and play with them given that it's you know, all at your fingertips in a digital manner. Right, I think we'll stop there. Right, so finally, this is, ignore the writing, this diagram just illustrates what I've been saying in terms of where we're going. You might, have, um, you might be out in the field and you might have it accompanied by a drone, collect a bunch of data. What you can then do is import that data either in the field to these field deployable GPUs I mentioned, or if you have um, internet access through 4G and so on, you can actually upload it to a cloud system that we've begun to build. And in the cloud, there's a seamless um, linking of all the different software packages where you can actually generate the 3D point cloud, begin to do some simple analysis, such as I showed you for the Century Mine, and then ultimately export the results to visualization packages um, that anyone can see around the world. Uh, that there's one we particularly like known as Previs. Or even in the earth sciences, we're very, of course, interested and concerned about publishing that data. So we use something, we're using something known as Figshare, where you can upload the images, the 3D models, and so on. And anywhere, anyone around the world can search for it and um, discover it, and then um, use it for their own purposes. And that is the end. So open to questions. Um, and while you're thinking about questions to ask me, the video you're seeing there is some of our other developments. We've got a drone we've been building that can fly underground. And we're trying to get it to actually create those 3D models in real time on board the drone using a completely different process known as SLAM. So what you're actually seeing is a drone flying down a tunnel at Fosterville Gold Mine. And on the left hand side, you can see the, the, the 3D point cloud slowly being built. So again, early days with that one, but it's quite intriguing. And a bit of fun. <laughs>